Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. We're really glad to see so many people here, and I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how civilians engage with armed actors in conflict settings for their own protection and how humanitarian and peace actors can support that engagement. So in our wonderful panel, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from both Nonviolent Peace Force and the Norwegian Refugee Council about some context-specific examples of the work that their teams are doing in South Sudan and in the Central African Republic, and from the Humanitarian Policy Group about some recent research that they've done in both of those countries. They have some forthcoming reports that I, for one, am very excited to read. And we're also going to hear a little bit about um, from Nonviolent Peace Force about their reflections on their global work around engagement with armed actors. I'm just going to say a few words to sort of frame the topic, and then we want to jump into to the main event, which is really our speakers. Um, so overall, I think in the past few years, we can agree that we've seen the protection sector and the humanitarian sector more broadly really made some strong progress in our thinking on protection outcomes in the way that we were sort of acknowledging that it's our responsibility to reduce protection risk. I think we're recognizing more and more that in addition to coming in to respond and support people who have been affected by violence, it's also our role to be proactive and to work to prevent protection risks from occurring. So one of the ways that I think that that progress has really been made, and I really want to give a lot of credit to the, the Global Protection Cluster and to the member organizations, many of whom are, are in the audience, is really that focus on the risk equation that helps us understand protection risk. And so we're looking at the threat, vulnerability, and capacity, those three components of protection risk that make up our understanding of those risks. However, I think that we do still continue to see that the component of that that gives us the most challenge is that threat component. It's the piece that we're really interested in understanding who's responsible for these protection risks. It really get, means that we have to understand the perpetrators. And in a lot of the contexts that we work in, of course, that means that we're looking at armed actors or actors closely affiliated with armed actors. That, I think, continues to be the most difficult part of that protection piece. And that's what we're really going to be digging into today. There's a lot of reasons um, why historically I think this has been challenging for humanitarian actors. And today we're going to hear about how organizations are work working on communities to address this, to engage directly with armed actors alongside communities and with an eye towards changing that behavior that is behind the protection threat. I don't want to minimize the challenges here. I think that there are really um, there's still some continued barriers and, and that's going to be a lot of what we hear from today. I think there's still a lot of concerns that organizations have about our own organizational risk, as well as fears that our actions may put community members at risk. Um, I think that, you know, there's continuing conversations about how to make sure that we're doing good risk analysis there, that we're not assuming risk where it might not be, um, and that we're really incorporating that analysis to make sure that we're clearly understanding what, what might cause us risk and, and what might not. I think that we're also... Um, Moving forward, and I would push us to continue to, to make sure that we're thinking that, you know, it's easy to, when we're concerned about sort of increasing our own risk, it's easy to make a decision to not do something and recognizing that that's also an active decision. And so really comparing all of the modalities of action that we're going to hear about today from organizations and incorporate that into our own risk assessment. Um, I think another piece of that, it's, it's it really comes into where those deep community relationships are important. It's equally as important that we don't assume risk for civilians when it's not there and that we're listening to them, their own analysis, their own understanding and their own choices that they're making in engagement with armed actors. Some presenters today are also really going to talk about what it takes to build those relationships with armed actors to demystify something that I think continues to be a challenge for humanitarian organizations. It can feel really difficult. It can sometimes feel a little bit off limits. So we're going to hear a little bit about some best practice and about some good experience coming from the field that I think will help us all build our collective skills in those areas. And then, of course, just one one final sort of comment that I think is going to going to also come through in our with our presenters today is that really working on any of these issues requires a nuanced and deep understanding of community strategies for threat reduction, for engagement with armed actors to make sure that our engagement or any external engagement doesn't undermine those strategies. 
Um, and I think this is going to be something that's really important as our, our appetite for this grows, as our willingness and our interest in engaging in these activities grows, that's going to be a really important thread for us to make sure that we're coming in in appropriate ways, that we're coming in in respectful ways, that we're listening um, and making sure that, that we're not undermining or stomping out any of those existing community efforts that we know will, will have been there since before we got there and, and will be there, of course, after after we may leave. Um. So really excited to hear um, from our panelists and excited to hear from the audience. So please feel free to, to put in questions into the, the Q&A box. We'll, we will have a Q&A section and, and be able to talk through some of your questions. Um, and to begin, we're going to really zoom in on a very specific context and, and watch a video, actually, um, that's going to gonna share some experience of nonviolent peace forces work in the Juba POC in South Sudan. We're going to hear some from some individuals in that site, a gang leader, a police officer, and some community members who have been directly impacted by violence and how they've worked alongside nonviolent peace force to prevent violence and strengthen those relationships in that community. So let's turn over to that, that video. seen the outside one. We only, since the war broke out in 2013, we only hear, we don't know anything what is going on outside the world. Right. My parents didn't have money to take me to school, so I decided to move with peer groups. They tell me, leave school, do everything that is not. So I decided to join their group. We used to move at night and hustle for money. So if you, ha you have nothing to eat, you have to go outside and steal so that you can survive and eat. The community in POC try to convince their children. They, they try to bring the police inside the POC. They didn't understand them. We, we police. We used to come, we usually come to treat them, to harass them, to beat them, but they will not understand us. They are still doing the crime. But the community leadership was threatening them, calling police to arrest them. That one, it did not work. Then, as an unviolent peace force, uh, saying we are using UCP, then now we applied uh, some of the UCP uh, strategy to engage the youth. We bring them together because it is not only one group, there are more than 10 groups, and this group are fighting among themselves. We build the trust among themselves, they come together at you. Yeah, when we are in our group, we, are, I, we, we used to fight with another group, but now we have stopped it. Then, uh, uh, we bring you together now, together with the uh, with the community leadership. We had separate dialogue, many meetings, trials that are between them. Then now uh, we reach to the point that youth 
they are not anymore fearing the community leadership. They now have the trust. Even the community leadership also, they now gain the trust with you. So from there, we went further to the third step of building the trust between the youth and the police at the shape point. We used to meet with a gang group in UCP. And by then, it is very rare and it is very difficult to sit with a gang group, to talk together, to eat together. But now, they used to move with us. And also, they get the chance to move in our area checkpoint. But last time, it is very difficult. The gang and the community became friends. People play football together. They unite themselves. We eat together. And we share things together. Wonderful. Um, great. So we're actually gonna gonna follow that video with some reflections from Nuan Twel Chol, who's Nonviolent Peace Forces Deputy Team Leader in the Juba POC, um, who's gonna talk a little bit about the ro role of the humanitarian organization in holding space for these engagements um, between gang groups and police. So Nuan Twel, go ahead. Hi. No. Hi, Nigel. Well, I think you've got something covering your video uh, camera. What is it? Your your screen is all black, but it wasn't before. Do you, is there anything covering the camera? There you go. All right. Uh, I'm Yan Phil, as uh, you guys here. I'm. Uh, I'm working here with the community at the IDP camp in Juba. So let me give you a little bit of uh, how this Juba form to be uh, a camp. So uh, the camp was formed after the result of the conflict that happened, that erupted in, 20, in 2013. So uh, there was a specific uh, tribe that was uh, targeted, then they decided to run into the camp. So uh, the UN opened a channel for them because they're being targeted in the towns. So uh, now the camp is being established. Uh, there is two camps here in Juba, Camp 1 and uh, Camp 3. So both camp NP operate in both camp. Uh, uh, there is a population around 50, 51,000 people that are living in the camp. So these people, they've been living in the camp since 2013 uh, when the war broke out. So uh, they are not to be able to come out from the camp. The, their children, they even grew up in the camp. Uh, from 20. 15 up to 2017, uh, that time there was no relationship between the government and the IDP. That led IDP not to come outside. Uh, that when you come outside, that, that one, it, it, it created a very big fear uh, between them because it was the same government who killed them. Uh, they don't want to see the government. Then when these children grew up in the camp, so they don't know the police or they don't know the government. Then now, the time uh, UN left the POC in 2019, uh, it was uh, a big disaster. Then uh, they formed themselves, they formed a group, a group of gangs. These people, they been terrorized the life of innocent people who was in the POC. They also come from the POC because they are the same children who have been living in the POC. They don't listen to anyone. They don't listen to their parents. So they don't listen to 
the community leadership. Uh, UN tried to engage them. Also, even UN, they reached to the extent that opening uh, a, a very small cell for them. When any one of them commit a crime, then UN asked to arrest them. So they failed also to listen to the UN. Then uh, it has become a big problem in the camp because they are doing a lot of crime. Uh, they are fighting among themselves. They are killing themselves. They are also raping girls and women in the camp. So they are also uh, attacking and robbing people. Uh, from there, uh, NP took an initiative of engaging them. Because as an unviolent peace force, we believe uh, in enhanced civilian protection. So we don't believe in the uh, power of gun, that when you are carrying a gun that to threat someone with a gun. We believe uh, of doing things uh, in an unviolent way. Yeah. So we engage with the gangs. It was very difficult to engage them. It was not easy. We engage with them. So uh, we carry out the patrolling, trying to identify where they sit. Then we build uh, the relationship with them. So uh, they accepted to come to our compound to have meetings. Then we had several meetings. From there, uh, we bring them together because it is like a 10 plus group. This 10 plus group, they are fighting among themselves. So they are killing themselves, as I mentioned it before. Then uh, we, 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 when they agreed, when we bring them together, they agreed to have unity or uh, a peace among themselves. Uh, we give them a lot of trainings, a lot of, uh, a lot of awareness raising uh, on the peace building and the trust building activities. Then when we knew that these people, they understand themselves, so we also detect another threat because uh, they are not in a very good relation with the community leaders. Then we took another step of building a relationship between them and the community leadership. So from there, uh, now uh, they come together because we build that relationship. Uh, community, community leadership now managed to reach out to them on a daily basis, asking their well-being because they have leaders, they have a connection. So now, uh, because the time when they was fighting with the community leadership, Community leadership, they do a backup. They got backup from the, the police, which is now the government police. Government police also uh, is another threat now for the gangs. And gangs tell us very clearly that we have a problem with the community leadership and the police. So see now we, we sit together with the community leadership. So uh, the trust that was brought between uh, was broken between us and the community leadership is already built now. Now there is a need for us again to meet with the police. This is where we invite the police commander to have a meeting with the gang. So it took us two weeks to convene the police commander to come and meet with the gang because in uh, principally this police, they don't believe in a dialogue. So when they see when when they see a criminal, they have nothing to do with a the criminal. They have to arrest the criminal, beat the criminal, and take the criminal to the jail. So we inform them, we discuss with them that this is not how this thing will uh, will be handled. So when we see them that insisting not not listening to what we are telling them, we propose now a training to have a training with the police on unharmed civilian protection. So uh, when we conduct a two days training on unharmed civilian protection, this is where the police convene. Now uh, there is another way that uh, to silence the force and we can convene the gang while we are talking to them. This is where the police came and they had a discussion with the gang. So 
uh, we we they conducted like uh, a two days consecutive days with the uh, with the dialogue with the gang. This is where the police realized that uh, the force that they've been using it was a very bad approach. So they are they have to apologize to the gangs. They also uh, has to tell to the community leader that the way that we use to approach this gang is not the good way that we can approach this gang. So now that means uh, this gang they believe in an unviolent or the UCP an armed civilian strategy to convene the criminal. So this is how uh, we've been interacting with the gangs. It took us time, uh, but at the last, they come together. Now, uh, the peaceful people in the community, now they're living freely. Some of them already opened their business. They see the light. Because uh, the reason why also this gang are behaving like this, it is, uh, as one of them has stated before, they never see the outside world. Even outside Juba, they don't know. Some of them, when they enter into the camp, they were seven years. So now they become like uh, 17 years or 18 years in the camp. They don't know anything. And also, uh, what, the, uh, what they experience in the camp, uh, it is what they want to put in the practice because there is no government in the camp. No one tell them this is wrong. They think killing themselves is is the right thing to do. But when no, the NP brought them... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Finish your thought. I was just going to gonna wrap up. But yeah, finish your thought, please. When NP brought them together, so we build the trust among themselves, uh, them and the police and the community leaders. Now, uh, uh, they have a connection. Great. Now they're working Wonderful. Closely. Thank you so much. Work. That's really useful. And there are so many details in there that I just want to dig into. So I hope that we'll have the chance during the Q&A. Really appreciate that contribution, Nguyen Twell. Um, We're going to move over to our next speaker now, um, Hubert Oldenhaus, the Global Head of Programming with Nonviolent Peace Force. He's going to talk a little bit about entry points and tactics for engaging armed actors on civilian protection in a, in a more global sense. So he's going to share some tactics that the, the nonviolent peace force teams use in Myanmar and South Sudan and some other countries um, to engage with armed actors on civilian protection. So I'll pass it over to you, Hubie. Thank you very much, uh, Leah. So yeah, I'm going to show a few tactics and entry points, some of them from Myanmar, Iraq and other places. And I'm approaching this primarily from a perspective of a practitioner, especially people who want to learn a little bit more about how do we shift from kind of vulnerabilities and capacities only to a focus on threats. Um, and I'm speaking both on protecting civilians um, from armed actors, the, the, the violence within their own ranks, but also how do we encourage, uh, like the example before, the police to, to, to responsibly protect civilians. Um, on the next slide, um, the, the first thing that we need to do is to kind of overcome the, the fear that a lot of us have um, when we're looking at armed actors. Uh, we often see them as kind of one big group of unified uh, opinion that is against us, that will not help us, that will not support us, and that we better stay away from as far as we can. And we kind of have to sort of connect with the human beings behind the gun in the way that Nyata was just explaining uh, his engagement with the police. Um, finding out what is their personal interest, what are their fears, what are their pillars of support? And it doesn't mean that we sort of have to trust them or, or, or collaborate with them. I think often we make a distinction within NP about between collaboration and engagement. So next slide. Um, this, this engagement, as Nacho was just explaining, is not so easy. And I think it requires continuous persistence uh, and a lot of creativity as well. Um, I remember a case from, from Myanmar where um, uh, a group of community protection actors were um, looking at a way, because the military is very keen on separating communities away from the militaries, 
the way the barracks are organized and so forth. So he said, I'm a barber. I have a barber shop. Soldiers still come to my shop and cut their hair. And when I cut their hair, I'm talking with them about protection. I'm talking about the ceasefire agreement and so forth. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, an avenue that I've often seen working in Iraq, in Philippines, and Myanmar with, with quite a lot of success is the mobilization of religious leaders. A lot of the times community protection teams uh, find themselves with a locked door. Military doesn't want to engage with civil society. They sometimes fear civil society. They, they see them as a threat. Um, and so I've often seen communities being very effective in going, for example, to a to monk um, and local monastery. They know that the military commander is going to pray at the monastery um, and they find ways to sort of connect. And so they go together with the monk or a pastor to meet the commander who is then willing to see them. And then in a way, they, they manage to negotiate the release of of a prisoner or um, someone has been forcibly recruited by the armed forces and so forth. Um, next slide. And another important tactic as well, and I've mentioned this example before, um, is to focus on threats that are not intentional. Uh, people that are caught in crossfires, rumors that are causing the mobilization of armed groups to retaliate, um, communities that are starting to mobilize on the basis of rumors and misinformation. And the intervention that I've seen community actors do uh, when they're really staying within their lane, we're not interfering with the military matters. This has often created a lot of trust among communities, but also trust among armed actors. They see what you're doing. It's very clear. And even that sort of engagement sometimes has led to almost a, a increased security for, for community protection uh, actors, because it's very clear what they're doing. So next slide. So another point that I wanted to make is, is the, the importance of uh, pinpointing responsibilities. I was speaking last week with, uh, with a woman who had done a lot of uh, accompaniment in, uh, in, in Palestine. This was before the current crisis. Um, but she said uh, in the West Bank, she was uh, trying to accompany Palestinians through checkpoints. And she, she told me a case of a, of, a, of a little boy, a four-year-old boy, with an acute uh, appendicitis. And she was really kind of focusing on one soldier and saying, okay, please um, get us through because it's a matter of life and death. And she said, I managed to do that sometimes when I really got to their level and touched the humanity and kind of forced them to take responsibility to either say no or yes. And she said, when it's, it's in a large group, it's much more difficult. So it's also a matter of understanding these dynamics. How can I get that person passed? Uh, next slide. So maybe one last example and it is also the, the um, creative ways. This is an example from Myanmar as well, where um, there was this military battalion coming into a village uh, in Eastern Myanmar. And this military battalion um, was looking for a place to settle. And the community protection team uh, put them into a, a local community center. Um, and then sort of they went out to collect firewood. They collected, uh, they helped them to get food. And I, and I asked them, like, why are you kind of going out of your way to sort of do all of that for uh, the, the military group that you don't really like very much? And, then, and they said, well, you know, if the military goes out into the village, um, we the community members will be will be feeling unsafe. Um, there may be sexual harassment. So our way of taking care of this group of militaries is a way to protect the communities from them. Um, another, another slide. This is a, this is maybe the last example uh, that I'm seeing a lot with with rebel groups, especially groups that are taking up arms um, to protect their indigenous communities. Um, and we've done some dialogue between community groups and they have sort of repeating back the kind of the, the lofty statements that some of those groups have, have, have put forward to, to protect communities. And sometimes mirroring back the, the attitudes and behaviors that those groups see in the communities and sort of getting those uh, armed groups that start off with very high ideals but sometimes degenerate into violence. And sort of those constructive conversations really showed as well a lot of uh, progress because 
they they want the legitimacy of the community. Let me leave it there and hand it back to Leah. Thank you very much. Thanks, UV. Super interesting examples um, of some of the creative ways that people are are approaching these challenges. Um, so moving right along, I want to introduce our next speaker, who's um, Gemma Davies, the Senior Research Fellow from the Humanitarian Policy Group. Gemma is going to discuss recent research and finding from the Central African Republic and South Sudan, um, where they looked at how communities engage with armed actors and then what the implications are for um, humanitarian and also for peace actors. So Gemma, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Leah. Um... Yeah, so, I mean, I think we've heard some great examples um, today on how civilians proactively develop strategies for their self-protection, including by seeking to influence the behaviour of armed actors to reduce the threats that they face. Um, and But we also know that this is often be below the radar um, and, and it's rarely recognised by international actors. Um, and it also is often not sufficient to provide protection to communities, particularly over the long term. Um, communities are, are strategic in choosing who represents them when carrying out dialogue with armed actors. Um, and while representatives are often drawn from leadership positions, people with moral or cultural or even faith-based influence uh, often outweigh those with political influence, particularly at that community grassroots level. Um, and representatives are chosen according to specific qualities. So this includes experience in carrying out dialogue and negotiations, the ability to remain calm, not to take a position on the actions of armed actors while using strategies of persuasion and compensation. And, you know, as, as we've heard already today, building trust and the ability to hold a neutral position are fundamental to successful dialogue. In both Central Africa Republic and South Sudan, um, they're both deeply spiritual and religious societies. Um, and as Hubert said, uh, often spiritual or faith leaders lead dialogue on behalf of communities. Uh, in both South Sudan and CAR, faith institutions historically instill a sense of respect and therefore trust. And they can often seek to demonstrate that they're outside issues of politics, identity, ethnicity. And as such, they're often seen as neutral and garnering authority through their position of, as representatives of the faith they represent. So one example in Central Africa Republic, uh, for example, um, is, is where religious leaders, whether from Christian or Muslim faith, took prominent roles to facilitate dialogue. Imams used religious holidays to negotiate a pause in conflict and violence and used religious celebrations to bring communities and armed actors together um, seeking to increase familiarity and therefore in a hope to reduce the levels of violence. And this also had the added value of supporting aid agencies to later gain access. Faith actors also have the strong advantage of, of you know, really strong networks which can cross territories. It can link lo local to subnational to national dialogue, as well as leverage international networks at times. Women are also increasingly proactively engaged in dialogue with armed actors, leveraging perceptions that they're non-threatening. In both South Sudan and Central Africa Republic, women have unique entry points to engage, for example, through intermarriage, by having greater ability to move across territories because of perceptions that they're not uh, threatening, and through their livelihoods that are often in markets and frequented by a range of conflict uh, actors. Women we found have often been involved in preparing for dialogue, for example, by passing messages by, between conflicting groups and exchanging information on the preparedness of armed actors to engage in dialogue. And they're also increasingly undertaking and also demanding a direct role in dialogue, seeking to leverage their symbolic role of maternal authority, portraying themselves as mothers with sons across all sides. So in one example in South Sudan, this led women to lead a dialogue on behalf of their community. They spoke of the harms that civilians had, had faced and uh, moved combatants to tears when speaking of those harms. And they managed to secure agreement, not only for the, for the um, non-state armed group to move the military base away from where civilians lived, but also to call off a planned attack in, in the coming weeks. And humanitarians can think about supporting, empowering um, women to further leverage their role as champions towards promoting restraint and the use of violence. 
But for humanitarian protection and peace actors to support community efforts, solutions have to be owned by communities. And too often, humanitarian interventions can undermine or derail community efforts, where external solutions are imposed without in taking into account the specific dynamics, culture and context within communities, it can lead to mistrust, insensitive approaches and can endanger the entire process. Protection actors should take their lead from community identified solutions and approaches, and that requires in-depth conflict and stakeholder analysis and understanding of community dynamics at those ultra local levels. Locally owned approaches also requires respect of customs and practices. So for example, again, in South Sudan, the sacrifice and sharing of livestock by eating together is a strong tradition, which indicates a successful dialogue, as is offerings of food prior to commencing a dialogue. But at times, communities can't carry out a dialogue on their own if, then, if they don't have food that's av available to share. So humanitarian actors have a role to play, both in facilitating dialogue, and we've heard some great examples from Nyantel earlier in terms of that bridging role that, um, that protection actors can play, but also in providing the, the uh, resources to do so. Humanitarian mediation is one approach um, to do this, and Unganan from NRC will shortly discuss NRC's approach to humanitarian mediation, which can really so, sort of look at how um, humanitarians can proactively reduce threats in, of violence in the midst of conflict. And evidence from research from CAR, um, which looked at NRC, DRC and OCHA's approach to humanitarian mediation, demonstrates the incredible potential that this approach has for reducing the risk of violence. Um, and can highlight that, it can highlight that even where humanitarian mediation has had less sustained impact, it still contributes to an overall reduction of violence um, and peaceful resolution to conflicts. But as one person we interviewed said, dialogue is iterative and any support um, to dialogue should mirror that. It requires flexibility, the ability to adapt and a willingness to take risks. But the humanitarian sector is often immobilized by decision makers and donors who are cautious as to the potential risks involved and can fall to a default um, of accepted interventions, even when they don't fall um, within demonstrating how they can directly reduce protection risks. Peace actors are far more familiar with doing this and far more experienced of the levels of analysis um, of needed to do this safely. So there's a lot that humanitarian actors can learn about um, working in complementarity with um, be between peace and protection actors. Um, and while yeah, facilitating... If you could just wrap up, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One sec. So while facilitating, you know, dialogue, negotiations and mediation brings, in, brings organisations into that uncomfortable space that Leah spoke to earlier, um, humanitarians have to recognise that though their remit shouldn't be to shape the political landscape, they have to accept their responsibility to reduce violence and use their full tool books to promote peace. Back over to you, Leah. Wonderful. And a great, um, I think, thought to, to end on that hopefully we'll be able to jump into in the Q&A. I do want to ask participants to, to make sure to put any questions or, or thoughts that you want the speakers to speak more about into that Q&A section um, on Zoom. We're excited to, to hear more from all of our um, all of our panelists in that section. So please do do add any questions that you might have. Um, our final panelist who's going to speak, I want to introduce Enganan Kulibeli, the Regional Protection Advisor for the Norwegian Refugee Council. And as Gemma mentioned, he's going to speak a little bit about NRC's experience with humanitarian mediation efforts in the Central African Republic and, and the relevance that that has to our whole discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Enganan. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tout le monde. Yes, thank you very much and hello everybody. Hello everybody. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. It's an honor for me to speak to you today on behalf of the NRC to present the work that we do at the Refugee Council. We work on um, humanitarian programming. I wish to discuss two cases with you that in the Central African Republic 
and then we'll talk about the resources that we used starting from 2017 until today and i will talk to you about the lessons learned during our program i will also provide recommendations for humanitarian actors as well as for fundraisers next slide please this is a first example. I will talk to you about work that we carried out in Bawali in the Central African Republic. For those who know the national context, Muslims and Christians have lived side by side for a long time. But in 2013, conflict broke out and the Muslim community had to leave the Bouali area and find safer places to be. They left behind their land and their homes and their belongings. Next slide, please. So, NRC was alerted to this and carried out a process to facilitate a dialogue that allowed dis for displaced persons when they expressed a wish to return to their area of origin, Boali. So NRC was alerted and carried out a community dialogue process. We first carried out a conflict-sensitive analysis to understand the conflict, and we then um, separ had separate meetings with stakeholders before. Then we organized a dialogue with all relevant stakeholders, including armed groups, who, some of whom had annexed some of the homes and goods of the displaced persons, that is to say displaced persons from the Muslim community. Following the dialogue, an action plan was drafted. Next slide, please. please. And the results were as follows. Following the dialogue, people agreed to put somebody in charge of all occupied goods, the occupied, uh, the occupied belongings of the displaced persons, to ensure that all these belongings be returned to their owners, that is to say the displaced persons who'd expressed a wish to return. Then, the community leaders within the framework of the action plan had carried out an awareness raising exercise, not just in the community, but also in the neighboring areas in, to enable the displaced persons to peacefully return and for there to be freedom of movement, not just in the town, but beyond in the whole area. Next slide, please. Following the dialogue, we noted that the, for displaced persons who returned, they went back to their area, they, they received their belongings again, there was free circulation, and they did not experience any violence against them. I will now present a second case. This case is regarding access to a school in Mingala in the Baskoto region. In 2021, we were alerted to a situation of violence against the children in one community. These children did not have access to a school and so they were regularly victims of violence every time they tried to, to go to said school. They were not just ex experiencing violence from other children, but also other community members because these were rival communities. We had to carry out a sensitive conflict analysis and we carried out free mediation work, so separate meetings to prepare the communities for dialogue. And following these discussions, the communities were able to ensure access 
to all children from the communities. And to this day, the children of both communities continue to go to this school. And they're able to learn in a protected environment. Slide, please. Following these two cases, and yes, there have been many other cases. Sorry, next slide, please. Go to the slide on lessons learned. Yes. So following the programs, NRC has understood that mediation, as my colleague has already said, that mediation has a huge potential in the reduction of violence for communities or against communities. We've also learned that mediation is a very effective way for communities and humanitarian actors to engage. It not only strengthens the sense of responsibility, but also guarantees the dignity and participation of all persons within the process, namely regarding decisions that concern them. Also mediation and humani humanitarian actors, sorry, have um, an important role in terms of um, facilitating dialogue and ensuring it is held properly. NRC has also noted that in terms of humanitarian mediation, where there's been a less durable impact, this mediation has still contributed to reducing violence overall and strengthening the capacity of communities in terms of mediation and peaceful conflict resolution. And so, given um, the lessons learned in terms of the programming and planning, NRC deems it important for humanitarian actors, both international and national, to focus on using mediation and community negotiation as well as doing capacity building within the community itself. We believe this is crucial within our mediation approach. Why? Because when we facilitate mediation, we still need to go beyond this and allow communities to appropriate um, dialogue and processes. This is not easy to implement. It requires close ties and relationship building. This through long-term presence and financial resources that also are available over the long term. The entire process requires solid analysis and awareness raising regarding the conflict to ensure that the conflict and the violence is not exacerbated by our intervention. Our analyses allow us to better understand the conflict and stop us from fanning the flames. Traditional conflict analysis methods do take a lot of time, though. This is why NRC is reviewing its methodology and focusing interventions on s stopping violence rather than coming to a long-term peace agreement. All of this requires a lot of experience and a lot of um, learning. Also, you need donors and partners who are happy to accompany you throughout the process. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Engenan. That was super interesting. I um, really appreciate those reflections. Um, so we are going to, to turn it over to the um, Q&A section. And so I will encourage you to keep keep putting those questions into the that Q&A section. We have a couple there. Um, and actually, what I might do is just stay with Engenan for a minute because we have a sort of specific question about, about your experience. Um, uh, Marine in the audience is asking about where the Christian communities went as those Muslim communities returned and how, and I think in, in some ways this is what I'm also quite curious about, is how did you convince them to leave the returnees to come back to their properties? So maybe a could you talk a little bit about what that engagement process was or what that community mediation process was between those communities that allowed them to, to come to, to the decision that they eventually came to? Merci pour la question. Alors, Thank you for the question. Of course, the Christian communities 
went nowhere, they stayed in the area. They just accepted to have a dialogue with their brothers in the Muslim community who then returned. So this guaranteed that they could return to their land of origin. Now, the Muslim community also come from Buali. They're not foreigners. It's just that they had to leave their land because of the violence. Now, as I said before, when we received the alert, we did an analysis of the conflict, trying to understand it better. We wanted to understand all factors that were that might exacerbate the situation. Then we had our separate meetings. Now, what did this mean? It means we had a meeting with the Christian community and another with the Muslim community. This to ensure that each party better understand the process and each party be available and ready to enter into a dialogue with the other. It was after that that we brought two communities together for a dialogue, knowing that there was a third party, I would say, the members of the armed groups who had annexed the homes and belongings of the Muslim community that was displaced. We then brought these parties together, so including the members of this armed group who had accepted to enter into a dialogue. And the discussion was led by the communities. We only had a facilitating and impartial role. We were impartial. The communities discussed the matter amongst themselves, and they themselves found solutions that they deemed valid and acceptable. We were only there to support, perhaps in drafting plans of action and in the implementation of said plan of action to allow for the return of um, the displaced persons to their land of origin. Thank you. Super interesting and, and really echoes, I think, the experience in CAR and South Sudan. Actually, there's a lot of similarities there and to, to how you went about that, which is is really interesting and, and we can talk a little bit more about as well. Um, we have another question from our audience that is is really about sort of acknowledging that, you know, the work that's being done to engage, to get in touch with, to discuss with, with groups that are known to the community, especially if their demands are, are sort of of a political nature and wondering about some of the challenges around engaging with groups that might be criminalized in areas that might be considered terrorist groups in whatever way we want to use that very complicated term or don't want to use that term rather. Um, but organizations, for example, in the Sahel, armed groups that might be um, have some claims of a religious nature and, and other ones. So maybe I'm going to throw it over to you, Hubie, to see if you have any thoughts about engaging with a wide range of groups. And then particularly, I think, in, in the current context, the fact that some of those groups might be criminalized locally or internationally, what, what impact that has on this kind of engagement? Sure. Uh, I think it's a really a good question that comes up in almost every conversation that we're having with communities in many different places. Um, let me speak slowly as it has to be translated. <clears throat> I think, first of all, I want to say that every group everywhere always thinks it is impossible because their army or their disarmed group is just worse than anything they can imagine. And maybe it works elsewhere, but for this, in our context, so I just wanted to say that th that doesn't mean it is, it, it is easy. It is, it is always very difficult um, and everyone struggles with it. Um, and it, 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 like I said in the previous uh, uh, slides, it, it is a lot of work. I think it, it, it is a lot of effort and, and hearing no and then hearing no again. Um, having said that, um, if the group is, is not sort of an illegally, uh, if you are still able to engage with the group, um, I think it, it, it really helps to understand their identities other than religious or, or everyone has, has other interests and needs that you can speak to and stay clear from kind of religious kind of discourse and really kind of speak to whatever is of interest to them, whether it's issues around sort of the land or issues about children's issues. There's always a multiple interest and, and needs that can be addressed and, and sort of you can find ways to, to connect to those needs. Um, I think also what has happened uh, a lot of time when you cannot really engage directly, show your good work on the ground um, rather than trying to get, get your feet foot into the door. Once armed groups or, or radical groups, they need to see what you're doing and they need to see what your use is. 
then they can trust you. Um, I think also, and especially when, when there are groups that are criminalized by the state and that the state doesn't allow you to, to engage with those groups, uh, and that is very tricky. Um, uh, some of the groups in, in, in different places ask that question as well. Um, but I've seen sometimes people finding ways to engage with the groups that are having some solidarity with those groups or their constituencies. Um, there are always people who are not part of the group but are close to the group. Um, so an engagement with those group, those people can be a, can be a first step. Also, what I've seen people doing is sending messages, not necessarily directly, but really making clear through writings or through actions on the ground what your intentions are and knowing that, that those messages are received um, by those groups. Um, and I think a lot of empathy as well, to be honest. I've, often we underestimate how much empathy we need to give before people actually want to have a conversation with us. That's great, Hubie. Those are some really practical um, examples of, of ways to, to continue that engagement. Um, I just want to also ask our audience, I know I've seen a couple of raised hands sort of pop up and come back down. And unfortunately, we don't really have the ability to, to call on people directly. But if you're able to put your questions or comments in that Q&A section, that would be great. We really want to make sure that we're getting all of that feedback that we can um, and all of your responses and questions from, from our speakers. Um, I'm going to ask Gemma a question now. So Gemma, one of the things that you mentioned briefly uh, that that's as a finding from this research is, is this challenge of risk. And so that organizations, um, humanitarian organizations in particular, maybe can be quite risk averse. And, and there sounds like there's lots of reasons for that sort of donor requirements or restrictions or organizational rules and policies or a whole host of things. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. And in particular, what are some good examples that that came out of ways that organizations can can address that or can move past that or any sort of good practice examples that came out in in the research? Yeah, thanks. And I think um, you know, obviously, um, and and for very understandable reasons, all organizations have to um, consider the risks. I think, though, part of the problem is not automatically thinking. You know, that, that there's a lot around thinking around potential risks. And quite a lot of the time, I'm talking about writ large in, in sort of the humanitarian community, there's less focus on sort of really according to that context, according to the communities you're working with and according to the different armed actors that they're trying to engage in in whichever sort of way you're trying to support, really looking down at sort of what that level of risk is um, specific to that situation. And I think then going further and looking to you know, mitigate those risks and and look at look at sort of yeah okay what's the residual risk and then I think balancing as well on the risk of doing nothing is what communities need and want from external actors. Um, I I think you know every every situation that's not that's not to underplay the level of risk. I think every situation is obviously unique. It needs to be approached you know very sensitively. And I think at the same time, this is where sort of real flexibility and adaptability is needed, because I think, you know, we've heard great examples here um, of where there is possibilities to engage. But at certain points in time, you know, you might have a change in command. You might, might, might be unclear of who is in command now. Um, things could change. You might have to pause. You might have to put things on hold completely for some time. So I think it's really about looking at sort of what is the situation, but then also looking at those entry points. And as Hubert really sort of well pointed out there, there, there are always interests um, and trying to figure out what those interests are. Um, I think someone that we spoke to as part of the research um, in a highly militarized area um, on the border of Sudan and South Sudan spoke to how, you know, it was really trying to take um, when engaging with armed group, with armed actors to try and talk to them in civilian terms and, and look at their civilian interests. So, you know, are there kinship ties? Are there familial ties? What is important to them? And as Hubert said, as, as, as well, sort of, what do they need? Um, one uh, community member said to us, you know, actually armed actors can't survive without communities. Um, they, they need them in order to, and, and this is not to say that necessarily they'll always be absolutely supported, but, you know, everybody needs food. Everybody needs to move. So, you know, often market points and those sort of really, 
um, localized levels can be can be entry points to engage. Um, can can you ensure that markets are still functioning? One of our researchers in South Sudan said to us, you know, people will always need and find a way to eat. So if that if that's then um, working through the marketplace um, and looking at entry points there, then then you know, and looking at really sort of cautious approaches to to bridging a bit of dialogue, then then that's a good starting point. Great. Thanks. And, and Gemma, I'm going to throw another question at you from the audience. Sorry to put you on the spot twice in a row. Um, the question is, our, one of our participants says they're very interested in your point around humanitarian actors' presence having an impact on dynamics and relationship between communities and armed actors. Um, what are some considerations that humanitarian organizations should take to better support and to not undermine community protection strategies? And are there differences with the way that international and local organizations or UN agencies should take? And, and maybe we'll go to you, Gemma, and then maybe we'll ask Nuan Twell to also come in to talk a little bit about his experience in, in working to, to make sure NP's not undermining those community strategies. Yeah, thanks. I think... I, I think a starting point is to have that really de detailed localized analysis. Um, and this is this is the point where I think, you know, peace actors um, are, you know, far, you know, far more experienced in it. So that really sort of localized, um, you know, stakeholder conflict analysis and then conflict sensitivity analysis. I think every organization, every actor needs to, you know, um, needs to recognize that their presence is always going to interact with conflict dynamics. So you have to recognize that and then take steps to mitigate it. So based on that super, super localized analysis, um, and then and then sort of take your lead from what communities need and want as well. So it's looking around those sort of dynamics. It's around it's around understanding what they are and conflict sensitivity really being based on that on that local level. And this is where I really I, I do think that there's um, a huge sort of entry point for humanitarian actors to learn from peace actors, not seek to replace them, but to learn from them, um, who, you know, it's part and parcel of what they do in having sort of conflict sensitive um, approaches and making sure that that analysis goes on real time and that it informs decision making. And yes, I think um, obviously sort of national actors generally have far more a nuanced understanding of those dynamics and those dynamics that aren't necessarily visible and can, and can provide that sort of ongoing analysis. So I think, again, uh, a great entry point for international organizations to sort of really integrate um, that level of analysis and um, from, from national actors as well. Great. Uh, Nuan Twal, I wanted to ask if you wanted to come in to talk a little bit about your experience and, and how the teams that you've worked with have really made an effort to not undermine those existing community strategies that are there. Well, thanks, Rhea. Uh, <clears throat> as I stated before, uh, having trust within the community uh, it will not, it will uh, boost the relationship between uh, what you are doing and what community is doing. Because uh, there is a say, there is a say uh, that uh, say, if there is a problem, there is also uh, a solution locally. Yeah. Uh, community, the community. And then now NP is working hard for sustainability uh, because one day NP will not be there. The community will make sure they solve their own issue. So uh, to make this thing happen, uh, there is need to build uh, the trust, the capacity of the community to make sure they do their own things. So, and also uh, you need also to know yeah, you are just adding a capacity because the community, they already have a capacity to do their own thing. Before you come and work with the community, they've been there as a community. But now, seeing you come, you need to put yourself in the position that to add a little bit of the knowledge to help them solve their own problem. So, uh, uh, and uh, in this world, situations are not, are not the same. So they are very different according to the context. So where we are rating here, uh, the community, let me say that they have a high trauma 
it is not easy for them uh, to listen to what you tell them. Unless you find a time, uh, you create a very a big time uh, for you to make them understand uh, because uh, having peace, it is a process. So if you write, there will not be peace. Yeah, you make sure you take the time to bring peace within the people. So when you write, the peace will not be there. Which means what you do, it will be zero. This is what we are doing as an harm civilian protection. So we make sure that our work is, is, is guided by the, a nonviolent principle in any intervention. So we respect also uh, the principle of uh, nonpartisanship. And this one is not alone. We make sure all the principles uh, are being adopted by the community as well to help solve the problem. Thank you, Nguyen Thuo. That's super interesting and really echoes a little bit of what, what Hubie was talking about earlier about empathy. So so how do we sort of bring that empathy to our engagement with, with all of these actors? Um, I want to pull out on something else that you were talking about, this question of time. I thought it was really interesting in, in your presentation and then Enganon in the way that you talked about your mediation work as well, that this needing to really take time to build those relationships at a community level, I think for me emerged as a really important sort of lesson there. Um, so, Enganan, maybe I can ask you to talk a little bit about how you manage within, you know, I think as humanitarians, we often don't feel like we have time, right? We might have short grants or we feel that the work we're doing is very urgent. We're dealing with very urgent issues. So I wanted to ask about how how you and, and your team in, in the Central African Republic really managed to make make time for, for this sort of work. And then afterwards, maybe Nuan Twal, if you want to jump in as well on that one. So, Enganan, over to you. Thank you, Leah, for your question. I believe that as a humanitarian actors, we need to continue that the communities, most of the time, will be very open. So as soon as you arrive here and you contact the community, very quickly there is a relationship that can be established. And when we started with our team, and uh, you receive a first a warning regarding violence or conflict, um, we, we kind of, we always start with a specific analysis of a assessment of the sensitivities when it comes to conflict and threats. And that's a kind of a, what we call the kind of a mapping of the actors to understand exactly who's doing what. And once you have here uh, this visibility on the different actors and you understand a little bit the dynamic, you can see the link between all the parties. And that's how you then understand and create your plan on how to establish a relationship with these different parties so that they accept you as a third party, but also slowly how they accept to come around the table and discuss between them. And that's why this uh, conflict analysis is essential in the mediation process. You need to have a deep understanding of the conflict, but also to establish this relationship between the different parties. Of course, you will realize very quickly that the traditional approach of this uh, uh, sensitivity analysis to conflict takes a lot of time. Mm. And of course, then it takes a lot of time and therefore it has an impact on the whole process. You can't just do that quickly. This is how it works. But I would say that uh, just to come back on your specific question, you can really start building the relationship in parallel to your analysis. 
But you have to start with really identifying the different parties and then understanding how you can create a relationship with each party. And once you reach that step, that means that you already managed to meet every single party, then slowly you're going to have to try to bring them around the table so they can all discuss together on this conflict. So it's a slow process and this is how you're going to be able to move uh, forward to resolve the conflict so they can discuss. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Nguyen. Super interesting. Um, Nguyen Twal, I wanted to see if you had anything to add on this question of the time that it takes to build those relationships and, and how you've managed that in, in your own work. Well, uh, if you want to solve a problem, you have to make sure that there will be a process. You don't need to be hurry. So, because uh, a human, a different human being, or a human being cannot trust you within one hour, within three hours, or within 24 hours. It needs time. So, you need to be patient enough to prepare yourself and have enough time to solve the, the problem. Because uh, the problem itself, that brings problem to the people, is not what you hear today, or it is not what you are seeing now. Uh, there is a different layer. So on that different layers, if you need to solve all this to come to the conclusion, then you need a time. You need to prepare time. So the work that we are doing here, it is not us as an unviolent stabilon. So we also have our uh, community protection team that are doing the same work that we are doing. So we have a youth protection team. We capacitate them. We also have a women protection team. We also capacitate them. We have a gender champion. So these people are also carrying the same message that we are giving to the, to the, to the community because uh, we give them enough capacity to solve the problem as well. So uh, these people, they help in building a trust also within the community leadership or within the community. So what I want to say it here, uh, if you want to solve a problem, it is not a one-day mission or it's not a one-month mission. It's take time and you need to prepare yourself to solve a problem. Great. Thanks, Nuan Twel. Um, we have a question from the audience that I'm going to sort of open up to, to any of the um, speakers that want to, to answer. Um, and and I, I, I apologize, my French is, is a bit non-existent. So apologies if this is a, mis a slight mistranslation. But the question is around um, how can we approach it when armed groups and, and other forces manage to accuse populations of collaborating with each other? So what does it mean when communities become either affiliated or sort of perceived to be affiliated um, with those armed groups. And, and the, the speaker talks about how in, in DRC, they're witnessing some arbitrary arrests at the hands of these parties. So as humanitarian actors, how can we how can we approach this when we see that communities are are maybe, let's say, taking sides or affiliated with with various armed armed actors? Um, is there anyone on the panel that that really wants to answer that question? I'm sure you all have have many things to say. Can I try it? Can I jump in a bit? Please, please jump in. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the place where we are operating as an unviolent peace force in South Sudan, it is a very complex country because uh, there is war every corner. And this war, it, uh, it divides the, the politician, the military, and even uh, the community themselves. So communities are being forced to join the army. So communities sometimes are also victims, between. Mm. So uh, our intervention here, uh, so if you want to intervene into such a situation, you make sure you understand the situation better. 
you call up more information uh, and you make sure uh, you trust yourself when you are engaging in such a situation because uh, people that are going to engage with you or people that are going to talk to you uh, from both sides, first, they have uh, a different strategy. Maybe they can accuse you before you meet them. So when they see you coming, then now uh, they will accuse you of being supportive of another side. So in that one, you don't need to be panic. You need to prepare yourself to engage. So uh, uh, for us as an nonviolent peace force, uh, we have a different strategy of engaging with the harm actors. So first, uh, it is the meeting. I can't say it. Uh, the places that we are reaching here in South Sudan, many organizations are not reaching it, including UN. Uh, and we are reaching those places because uh, there is a trust. When there is a trust, when you build trust within the community, so the community, the same trust, they will inform the other people about you. So this is it. This is mm -hmm. what I can't speak. Sure. Um, Gemma, maybe, do you want to also come in on this question? Yeah, I guess um, in, in situations of conflict, there's always going to be suspicions. And um, it's always a situation that uh, civilians are suspected suspecting each other, but also suspected by armed actors of supporting the opposition, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is where, and, you know, we've heard some really powerful examples today from, you know, Nyantuel, Huiba and uh, Nganan on, on the bridging role that um, the external organizations can play. As Nyantuel just said, you know, where you can build trust, you start with a pre-dialogue and then you can start to sort of break down some of these perceptions um, and then really play that bridging role to, 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 to increase familiarity and therefore, um, you know, sort of, yeah, get around some of some of the negative perceptions that are there. So I think th just the process, um, as many others have talked to today, just the process in itself helps break some of that down um, and, and build trust over the longer term. Great. And then Enganan, I think you also have a comment. Oui, merci. Je yes. voulais... I would add that beyond everything that can be done, for example, analysis within the community, to build a relationship of trust with the community, you need to stay close to humanitarian principles. It is very important for the community to know that you are independent and neutral. They need to feel reassured by your independence and neutrality. Now, this is very important. It is something that you must communicate to the community, because in a situation of conflict, when you communicate with one party, you need to tell them that you are also speaking with the other party. What this means is that both communities know that you are speaking with the other regarding the same thing and in the same way. These principles are fundamental to build a relationship of trust, and only then will the parties accept to have this dialogue, to sit down together and to allow you to facilitate a dialogue between the two parties. So you need to remember humanitarian principles of impartiality and neutrality. Thank you. Wonderful. Really also all, all great answers to that very challenging question. Um, we have time for one more question and I'm going to throw one to Hubie and, and I'm only going to give you about two minutes to answer Hubie. Um, but I wanted to ask, you talked a little bit about creativity in your presentation and I loved that example of a barber who talked to all of his customers about civilian protection. Um, and I wanted to ask about how, how can we encourage that creativity in our teams in the frontline staff that are often the ones doing this direct engagement. Um, and if you could just, you know, briefly share with us some experience and how to how to support people to feel empowered to, to come up with those ideas and, and implement them. <laughs> um, good question. <laughs> um, I think I think one one thing is is a lot of reflection among different groups, among sort of practitioners and taking the time to reflect. 
Um, that's that's one thing that I think is really important. Um, I also think that for organizations, if everything is too structured uh, and if you have too many protocols and policies, you are kind of forced into a box that sort of doesn't allow you to be creative. And of course, that is difficult because you cannot, as a practitioner, say, like, I'm just going to change my organization's protocols and policies. But I just wanted to say that as well, that it is helpful to have space where you can try something and it may not exactly work. And and and, and, and you, you can experiment a little bit uh, if the security allows that. Um, other things of creativity, I think is doing a lot of lots of exercises and creative exercises sometimes in trainings and role, doing lots of role plays and sort of coming up with 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 different ways that we can uh, yeah brainstorm creative ideas I think it is also very helpful and learning from each other like we're doing here um, but yeah I think the organizational part is also something that I think is important to take into account Wonderful. Really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to close the Q&A part. I want to thank everybody who contributed questions and thoughts um, in the chat and in the Q&A section. I think it's it emerged some really interesting um, facets around this, this complicated topic. Um, and then to close, I'm just going to hand it over to Sara Broad, who's working as a senior policy advisor with a focus on protection at CEDA's humanitarian unit, um, and ask her to, to close us out with some reflections from that donor perspective and, and from, from what CEDA is, is, is interested in, in in this area as well. So I'll hand it over to you, Sara. Thank you very much, Leah, and, and, and thank you to all of you. I, I think this has been really, truly inspiring, and I don't know what to add, <laughs> actually. I, I think I learned so much uh, from you, and thank you for being so concrete also in the examples that you have provided today uh, from around the world and, and coming from, from, from the extremely important work that, that you're all doing. Um, yeah, just for us to take part in this kind of discussions, learning from you what works when it comes to prevention of violence is really important. Um, in, in Sweden's humanitarian strategy through CEDA, we have a specific outcome on reducing the, dis the risk of violence that affected population face in humanitarian settings. So... So I think we have a lot to learn. We are keen to support our partners to contribute to collective protection outcomes and to work on results-based protection as per the YASC protection policy. We agree with the fact that humanitarian actors should and must engage collectively to achieve meaningful protection outcomes that reduces the overall risks to affected uh, persons by decreasing the threat, reducing vulnerability and enhancing capacities. And I think as we saw, as we have discussed today, that part of, of reducing the threat is often forgotten or we don't know as much uh, about it. Um, I think we as a donor, we need to learn from you about what works, um, what are the limits, uh, and how can we overcome uh, those limits? And, and what are the opportunities out there? I think, as you mentioned, every context is, is specific. Uh, and we need to be very open to have this dialogue uh, with you that, that are actually present there. Um, but also to ensure that communities are really put in the center uh, of the work that is done. Um, I think maybe a sharper focus on prevention uh, of protection risks from the outset uh, and ensuring timely uh, focus on prevention, accountable and locally driven protection response is critical, um, especially as we see uh, the situation today with the spiraling number of people in need, uh, limited resources and and violence against civilians in many parts of the of of the world, and we need to together look at how we can do protection differently uh, in these contexts. Um, maybe as a donor, we could also um, look a little bit more 
uh, at collective protection outcomes in the sense of people being truly protected rather than looking at how many number or the number of people having been reached by services. Um, we also do see uh, a need of looking at prevention from violence from a nexus perspective. And I think we discussed that a lot today. Um, how can we how can we encourage increased common understanding, coordination and synergies between humanitarian, peace building and, and human rights actors, for example. And I, I also realized that while preparing for this and, and reading some of the reports from you all over the, over the last few years, um, we also started to discuss much more with our colleagues implementing CEDA's peace strategy. And there's so much to learn from each other when it comes to a community-based peace building, social cohesion, humanitarian mediation, um, and I think we can do a lot as donors to kind of keep on bringing partners together, uh, humanitarian protection partners, uh, peace partners, and kind of foster these discussions around complementarity that, that Gemma spoke about as well, not duplication, but complementarity and really building on each other's uh, interventions. Um, and I think, Ganan, you... you, you you talked about this as well. I think there's something in the fact that our partners working more on from the peace building perspective, there is a time frame to it. It needs longer term interventions uh, and sustainable uh, results, whereas humanitarian uh, interventions may be shorter. And it's also okay if they lead to shorter term results in terms of interrupting violence. Um, so I think there is really a, a good discussions that we can have uh, together and that we can contribute to as donors also with, with the different tools that we have. Um, we spoke about, and, and you all spoke about, the importance of having a conflict perspective, a deep uh, um, conflict sensitivity analysis, and that's something that CEDA requires from all our partners or humanitarian partners, peace partners, or or more development partners. I think we also there see um, that our humanitarian partners can learn more uh, from from the traditional peace building uh, partners. But we also see that that's really a kind of entry point for increased collaboration, increased discussion, and common understanding. Um, so that is something that we support uh, through our, our peace strategy, for example, through uh, um, our contributions to Safer World and, and flexible contribution to, to Safer World so that they can maintain country-specific conflict advisory units, for example. So uh, this is another, in another area where we need to work closer. Finally, and you all mentioned it, the need uh, for flexible and longer term or multi-year financing. That's something that we have both from, from our peace unit and, and, and humanitarian unit. In the humanitarian unit, we are looking at increased multi-year funding. Um, we also realized um, how important it is if you're supposed to work community-based, how important that relationship building and trust building is. And I think all of you mentioned it as as, as uh, the basis to being able to work in this kind of, of way. So I think there um, our flexible and multi-year financing is, is really useful. It allows partners to be present and to build relationship uh, with communities. Flexibility, and some of you went into that as well, it also helps our partners to be flexible and adjust uh, to the situation to opportunities uh, coming up and also to adjust to what communities identifies as priorities when it comes to uh, prevention of violence. So I think I'm going to end there just to say I learned a lot. Thank you so much to the organizers. Thank you so much to the speakers. Um, it's been truly inspiring today. <laughs>